One of the players in my group has his character purposefully tried to steal some of the MacGuffins we have to return to a guy. Eek. Because the thing is, like, with with player actions, you can't really just, like, immediately beat the shit out of them because they're another player. Like, you have to kind of be considerate of their... their feelings, their preferences, their own agency. You know, so if... If I was a DM and somebody somebody just said like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna just charm player B's character uh, because I want them to do something for me. Like, if everybody was used to it and everybody was cool with it, I'd be fine. But if it was like a, a campaign where people aren't like immediately close together and might not be as understanding, I'd be like, no, that just it doesn't work. And so even with the stealing from the party thing it's just like that only that only works if like the dm is in cahoots with it and has a good reason for it otherwise it just feels shitty also named his character lawrence p x x oh gosh why where's all this water coming from the state of california Look, if Nestle can just carte blanche, uh, grab as much water as they they want from from California, then so can I. If you want a PvP style murder mystery, it's good. Yeah, like I I would absolutely love to do a social deduction D and D campaign at some point. I think it would be fascinating, and especially with the wholesome verse, who you know plays an egregious amount of social deduction games, I feel like it would actually work really well. However. Uh, I would only do with everybody, you know, being on the same page that one, one, two, two, or even maybe three of these characters are traitors. Not all the traitors might be aligned. You know, they're keep an eye out. And if you do see somebody acting in bad faith, you can actually like engage, uh, engage them in PVP and it's mechanically supported. Just be ready to roleplay it hard. Uh, and you know, keep it short and as long as everybody's on the same page, it's not a problem. Uh, but it's it's when a player suddenly decides unilaterally, like, nope, I'm going to be like this. That's that's when the whole thing breaks down, because effectively, role-playing is a social con social construct, social contract. You know, when you're when you're playing with uh, these other people, especially when it's like make believe, I it's no different kind of from playing like uh pretend in elementary school. You know, when you'd like well, I don't I don't know how many of you guys actually avidly played pretend, but I I did to some degree and there was always like the kid that would be like, "You can't hurt me. I'm invincible in like the play pretend." And so you'd be like, "All right, fine. I do this and this." And it's like, "No, that doesn't work either because blah blah blah." Like rules for thee but not for me is the moment when these social con contracts break down and the whole game breaks down as a result. And, you know, sometimes, once again, can be okay. There's plenty of exceptions where it does work. Uh, but if not everybody's ready for it or in agreement, then it's not okay. I mean, and this is true of, like, a lot of things. Like, for me, uh, just as a person and in life, I have a very... I'm going to just pre-wet a bunch of things just for a little while, see if that actually helps. Um, but for me, I have a very, very hard, no speeding, uh, well above the speed limit, no texting while driving, no donuts or weird car tricks. If I'm a passenger, I have... I don't know if I'd call it light PTSD, because I feel like that minimizes what PTSD is. Uh, but I freak out in cars if like people are driving badly, and so I really like being in a car with... You know, my folks and Shell, because they drive super sane. But, like, I ended a friendship with a guy because he was texting while driving in high traffic. And ended my friendship with another guy and stole his lightsaber. Not really intentionally, he just left it in my stuff and I brought it home with me. And then just never gave it back. Because he was texting while driving at 90 miles an hour on the road. And it's just like... There was a social con contract there to some degree, unspoken, but it's just like... You don't just do that to somebody in your car. Sure, it's your car, but, like, make sure the person in the 
uh, in the car with you is like okay with it. It's the yeah, same thing with like, uh, what's a good example? I mean, playing like a co-op game uh, with friends, setting the difficulty. Oh, what difficulty you want to play on? Ultra hard? No, I'd actually like easy. Well, you're playing on ultra hard anyway. It's like suddenly, why play with this person? It's not fun anymore, and it's not worth it. Um, texting and driving at 90 miles an hour. I actively was like hiding, uh, in my seat as best as I could because it was terrifying. I'm super glad we got back fine. Uh, but I, I, there have been very few moments in my life where I'm like, I might actually die here. That was one of them. And I think that was the one that I was like most scared shitless by. And this was, you know, a couple months after me getting in a bad head-on collision that pretty much to totaled my car. And so, like, these people knew I told them about it, and they just didn't give a shit. So I'm like, well, you broke that social contract of friendship, therefore, bye. But I, I think one thing in life a lot of people almost are kind of never taught is that it is okay to actually, like, cut people off for doing these things. Uh, so, you know, I see all sorts of dungeon masters talking about, like, problem players. Uh, just to go back to tabletop RPGs. Uh, you know, talking about having a problem player that they, they are having trouble dealing with. You know, the character that is hitting on all of the female NPCs is just gross. But also, like, look, if they're, if they're misbehaving, just give them the boot. They're not worth it. They're not worth keeping around. Is 90 miles an hour 160 kilometers? Frankly, I don't know, but that sounds about right. It works both ways. If you have a problem DM, you can always talk to them about the problem. Yep. Or you can just leave. Like, that's the other thing. I It's not worth suffering for other people's amusement. But so, like, I, I've seen a lot of stories go by because I'm subscribed to, like, a number of D&D uh, help advice thread kind of deals. And so, like, one of them was straight up uh, the D DM. I think it was the DM had come out as trans. And the one of the players was actively just like, you're going to hell for this. And it's just like, Ugh, you know, take that shit back to the, well... Get out of here with that kind of mentality. But, you know, this this problem player was effectively just, like, actively insulting at, uh, them with uh, dead names and hate, sm hate speech, hate smeech, uh, and so on and so forth. And it was kind of just like, the DM was like, what do I do? How do I get them to stop? And the answer is, you just kick them out of the game. Who cares? You don't want that kind of person in your D&D &D game. It's not worth it. I had a DM intentionally killing my character just because I got into a diplomat's house, stole and changed the documents for him to get arrested, and then killed the guards. Rolled four nat 20s in a row for deception and the other skill Tessie put in front of me. Then I got a jump of the fence and rolled a nat 2. Told me his character slipped and broke his neck. Wow, yeah, screw that DM. Like, that would only work if you were doing something really stupid where it's just like, anything short of a miracle, your character is dead. So, like, if I'm trying to hop over... A moat of lava. Um, and, you know, it's... I, I've already used up pretty much all of my, like, heroic feat points and deus ex machina tokens and all of those other things. And I'm like, I'm going to leap over the moat of lava. And it's like, you realize it's like a 20-foot gap, if not more so, and your character's not good at jumping. Like, it's going to take a miracle to clear that. And, you know, if, if I then said, yep, I'm doing it anyway, and then I rolled, like, a 3... If my character dies, it's on me. Like, that sort of thing is fine. But that's just being vindictive on your DM, on that DM's part. And, like, good riddance. Yeah, Rule of Cool can only go so far. I mean, it depends on the campaign you're playing. You know, if, if you want to have, like, a really over-the-top campaign where, like, literally nothing can ever go wrong, it's just the campaign changes to adjust for whatever consequences instead. Like, okay, that can work. But... You got to know that beforehand. Hey there, I've got one heck of a filthy sidecar if you can help us fit it in. I'm gonna run it up to you if that helps.
Why are all these places so dirty? Yeah, I I wish with some of the dirt that they actually uh like you can tell they definitely put some extra effort into showing like yeah it's clear it's clear there are skateboards going here. But I wish for like the walls, for example, there was more dirt lower. And like way more graffiti, I think instead of all of this mud. I mean I I guess I guess the dirt is more concentrated lower, but like way more graffiti and like layers of this stuff than dirt. Let's see. Even with the spookiest looking encounters, there's like a 5% chance that uh, at most that even a single character is going to die by no fault other than dice. Yep. And, uh, I had one character in one of the few campaigns where I was just a player. I had a character got crit. I think it was by, like, it was effectively a peasant with a scythe. I think we're level 2 or something. 2 or 3, and I was a sorcerer. I got crit by a peasant with a scythe. Uh, in just kind of like a random, uh, effectively the peasants were starving and were resorting to banditry and we were sent to stop them. And so the peasant crit me for, I think it was four times damage because it's back in third edition. Um, crit me with his scythe for, it was like 30 damage and I only had like 15 HP. I wasn't a very tough sorcerer or wizard. I wasn't a very tough person. And so suddenly I've been crit for like, a bazillion damage and shit I don't remember what exactly happened but effectively uh nobody could get to me because the encounter just went heinous for them like these just basic peasants with spears and short bows and whatnot like managed to I think they dogpiled the dude in armor because effectively uh the DM the DM had kind of explained it beforehand like they they'd specifically had, like, traps to tackle people in armor. Like, we knew what we were getting into and we thought we'd be fine. But they got the jump on us and, yeah, aced me in one hit. Uh, used grapple effectively against the armored dude. Uh, and then everybody else was kind of on the run because there was just enough of them that it was an issue. Uh, and yeah, I just got, I just got blasted on the first go and I was just like, wow, that sucks. And started rolling up a new character while the other players were just trying to survive. And I was fine with it because it was like, yep, alright, that makes sense. Because it didn't feel vindictive on the DM's part. I felt, you know, a little bit like, can't you fudge those numbers a little bit? But it was such a, like, ridiculous thing that it was, like, totally fine, whatever. You know, the DM thought he made a reasonable encounter, did all the math, it seemed to work out, and... Then RNG said, no, 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 this encounter is suddenly so much harder than what you were expecting it was going to be. Same goddamn campaign, we found out that alligators have ridiculous crit chances, or crit damage, in, uh, in 3rd edition. Uh, we were just going through a marsh, I think it was, like, the subsequent character, and just, like, an alligator, uh, like, we just had a random encounter with alligators in the marsh. And they... I want to say they had, like, times three or four times, like, crit damage or something just absolutely wild like that. And so they, like, the alligators killed almost the entire party. They didn't kill my character because he could levitate. Uh, but everybody else just got blasted. And it was kind of just like, at that point, nobody was mad at the DM for sending that against us. Uh, and our all of our characters had this, like, unhealthy fear of alligators and marshes and then the dm would send alligators at us on the regular but they never got they were never quite as busted as that one specific encounter but like it was memorable and it was kind of fun despite all of that because it's like sometimes a character death in D&D can be just as impactful as like living and actually succeeding at what they're trying to do even if it's an rko by a peasant with a scythe or an alligator Because I don't remember what those characters were doing. I, d I don't remember what grand quest they would set out on. But I remember getting killed by the alligator and I remember it being pretty wild. Uh, let's see. My character is a warlock at the time and I think after we killed the alligators I threw them in 
uh, it was like a specialized bag of holding that I would carry, carry dead bodies around in. And I'd reanimate the alligators again and again and just send them after, uh, after our foes. They didn't crit nearly as much, though. It was, like, it was sad. I mostly used them as an intimidation tactic. Because I think it was, uh, we got killed so hard by those alligators that the whole world kind of changed to reflect the fact that alligators are somehow incredibly deadly. Oh, there's a soccer ball here. I feel like I should be able to pop, pop the ball. Yeah, packed of Pokemon's Warlock. I Warlocks in 3rd edition, more or less just being able to animate dead at will was so good. I was constantly trying to convince my DM to let me have animate object instead, so I wasn't quite as ghoulish. Um, he didn't like the idea, unfortunately. Because I really wanted to be, like, effectively uh, just carry around just like a shit ton of stools, throw the stools, and then set them loose on people. Effectively be Apprentice Mickey Mouse. But, uh, out for blood. Like, it would have been so good, but I never I never got the chance, which just makes me sad. At some point, I'm going to give, um... Maybe in my next campaign, once the characters get up to a high enough level, I'm going to give one of the players, like, an artifact that lets them do animate object at will. Uh, but... They have to continuously make perform checks to keep them going, and so... Almost to the degree that their character stops acting, or, like, doing as much, but they have a small army of furniture instead. Because I think that would be really fun! Yeah, uh, so if you guys are... Uh, if you guys remember my Grave of Man campaign, that character was kind of a cameo with a table mancer. Yeah, so, like the druid of the animated tables, same character. Like, that, that was... I mean, okay, the... it was a warlock originally, but, like, whatever. Technical difficulties as a result of me having to sneeze and blow my nose. Fun stuff. Ah. Yeah, this is why I want the industrial power washer. Because, boy, this graffiti doesn't even want to come off. I mean, I, I guess this is probably what soap would be useful for. Pre-wash with some of the soap. But, like, eh. Effort. Yeah, it's fair. The red nozzle deletes it. It just doesn't have quite the AOE that I'm looking for. Actually, yeah, it's a bit bigger. What I should probably get is the, uh, the, like, squiggly rotating nozzle. Let's see. But... I'm saving up for that industrial washer before anything else. Now, are there any other, like, major power washers, or is that the extent of the tools available in this game? That once I have the industrial washer, that's it. Yeah, is there a meta for power washing? I'm pretty sure there is. There is a meta for any kind of game that has a little bit of variance in what, like, what you can do. Uh, let's see. There's a guy who used a pressure washer for a long time. The squiggly end is nice for getting a general clean. Huh. I've only ever really used pressure washing for, like, one summer. Yeah, I'm just gonna kind of... I'm going to speed up a little bit. Oh, that reminds me. Somebody was complaining about getting motion sick with this. I might actually be able to do something about it. No, frustrating. Yeah, the issue is... Uh, what this game needs is an FOV slider, and it doesn't have one. Uh, it sucks. Because, yeah, I forgot that some people were complaining that they had motion sickness watching this. And normally I got FOV issues, but this game is slow-paced enough that I don't need to worry about it. 
But from the perspective of, like, if I was playing, say, Borderlands with this FOV, I would be violently ill and would have to stop. I get really bad headaches. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to... There we go. Perfect. Oh, this one's kind of easy. Oh, but it's so clean, though. I don't want to delete it. Well, too late now. One thing I always liked to do as a kid was find, like, concrete and using a bottle of water draw designs in and then kind of watch as it faded out. It was always really cool. I don't really do it as much anymore because the uh, concrete around here isn't nearly as, like, absorbent. Uh, let's see. Whereas the concrete in California was kind of this, like, it was like a very tan gray. Super absorbent and, like, almost always really clean. I think it's just a lot of the stuff had been made in the 80s and 90s, so it was pretty easy for them to, uh, well, pretty easy for them. It was just, uh, it was just a lot nicer than some of the other places I'd lived. I <sighs> wonder what's the most funny or interesting character you've encountered in a D&D campaign. I don't know. And the problem is, I'm always the DM, so it's just kind of like, I'm usually the purveyor of the funny or the interesting characters that everybody else encounters. I really liked uh, Kakujo's Magic Boyd in uh, in the campaign that we kind of started last year. Just purely because he came as a result of like a weird joke and then we just... He ran with it so well. You seem like you'd be a good DM. Thanks. I I enjoy DMing. I can't wait until I actually have players that are super available for stuff. Because I want to say maybe soon. Like, two of my potential players are moving from one house to the next. Uh, Wholesome Verse is always just kind of all over the place. We're mostly just waiting until it's not going to destroy Rito's life. Because um, that poor boy is busy. In a way that, you know, like, I am, I am busy and I'm arguably busier than most people generally ever will be. But for me, it's very manageable. If something goes wrong, I've got a backlog a thousand years long. That I can be like, wow, I can't record for this week. You know what? I've got 30 days worth of roguelikes that I can just fall back on and not have to worry about it at all. Uh... And, like, even beyond that, I've got a gazillion clips. I've got, uh... I've got at least, like, a couple of retro series that I've just never put up. That I could easily just put out, you know, uh, Homeworld 1, Resident Evil 3. Uh, at this point, I've also got Shadow of the Colossus and Power Washing Sim. Though, those are going to be scheduled to go up while I'm on vacation. But, you know, if something, go if something goes wrong for me, I can adjust rel relatively well because my... My channel has kind of been built around the idea of backlogging forever. Um, but, so for him... Uh, getting the vaccine by all accounts was absolute misery compared to, I think, what most people have to deal with. And so that really set him back. And so it's like, I could start D&D without him, but I'd feel bad. I don't know about you guys, but like, I was, I was one of those kids that uh, often wasn't always like invited to the, the cool thing. You know, my friends might do a thing and I'd be excluded from it for whatever reason. And, like, I always hated that. And, like, even if I was busy, I really, like, 
even if I was busy and I was kind of like, yeah, you can do this stuff without me. Like, it still didn't feel great. And I really wanted to, like, participate even if it didn't make sense. So, like, I remember uh, with one of my ex-girlfriends in college, uh, I wanted to spend ti more time with her and my friends at the time. And they effectively convinced me, you know, no, I should go to bed. They're not going to do anything interesting. They're just going to be hanging out and doing whatever. Uh, and, and, like, chatting uh, late into the night. And then I wake up the next day to find out that they went on this, like, four-hour middle-of-the-night journey that, you know, they would not stop talking about just how wild it was. And I was just so frustrated and mad. And, like, frankly, I, I think that specific event uh, kind of wrecked a lot of my potential friendship with everybody else and then relationship with her. Uh, because it was just kind of this, like, really crappy feeling of, like, so wait, you know... Because the reason why I was even tired is I had done all this extra work for the gr like the friend group in general. Because we threw a charity event and I did like the lion's share of so much. And then they did like an after party without me. Uh, and told me not... Effectively told me not to come to it uh, through omission. I was always just like super grouchy about that. I don't think I really uh, talked about it because, you know, broke up with her. Well, she broke up with me soon after, which... Kind of makes sense why I wasn't included, maybe. Uh, but it was just, like, a super dirty thing to do, and I've always been like, eh, whenever that sort of thing happens. You know, like, I could potentially do, like, a one-off D&D thing just to, uh, just to be like, yeah, okay, we've played some D&D, &D, now I don't feel like I need to play D&D &D right now. So I can handle the goof. I don't know how goofy I was back then. I was, I was probably goofy, I don't know. I think I was a little bit more needy. That I am. I'd never been in like a long-term relationship that had ended well. And so I think I craved effectively what I've got with Shell. So, ultimately I am the winner and she ended up uh, marrying her stalker. So, cool, weird, gross, uncomfortable. wasn't exactly her stalker but he was he was a creepy dude that really wanted to get with her for pretty much the entirety of college and would like actively insert himself into friend events so he could be like close to her and spend time with her and it was just like I think she was too nice to say no and then I guess eventually that actually turned into something a little bit uh, less well, something actually real, but it was just like, uh, at the time. Yeah, so a stalker, pretty much. What the hell is the grime on these stairs? Oh, I see. It's on the rail. This is the same guy that took panty shots of, like, several other girls and, like, some other things. Like, at some point, that might get back to the guy, and, like, they get might get mad, but, like, screw it. It was weird as hell. And I, I hope he has matured tremendously in the aftermath of all of that, but, whoo, in the moments, like, the... I... I'm... I have trouble with new people sometimes, and I don't know if it's just kind of a me thing or whatnot, but every once in a while I get, like, just bad vibes from a person, and no matter what, I'm just... I am mean to them, because I know I'm never gonna like them. And this was one of those guys that I met him, and, like, minute one, I was like, I don't like this person, I will never like this person, and nothing he will ever do will do anything other than validate m this opinion of them. And, you know, what do you know? I was right. And, uh, so he was one of those people that I was just like, Oh, you're creepy. You're creepy and bad. Yeah, bad vibes is your brain seeing more than you realize. I mean, this is a guy that put motor oil or some kind of, like, dark oil in his hair to slick it back because he thought it made him look cool. Like, this is the kind of person that, you know... There was something off about him, and it wasn't even that I was, like, subconsciously reading that. 
It's that I was not willing to actively ignore what was wrong with him as a character on a visual level to give his personality the benefit of the doubt. Let's see, modern day greasers exist? Sometimes. I mean, think of, think of all the people that wear, like, fedoras, unironically, nowadays. Like, yeah, sure, a number of people can pull it off, but, you know, dude wearing socks, sandals, a trilby, a nerd shirt, and, like, a suit jacket, and probably cargo shorts. Like, that's, that's not a consistent style that screams fashion sense. That is a consistent style that reads, this person desperately wants to be fashionable, but has no idea what they're doing about it. Don't diss my local team. I'm sorry. Hey, thank you, R3 King, for the raid. Welcome on in. How are you doing this fine and lovely evening? Afternoon evening. Whatever time it is. Outfit of choice, hoodies, jeans, and beanies. Yeah. I want to get one of those beanies with a brim. Like, at some point, uh, at some point my hair is going to, uh, fly the coop entirely and I'll have nothing. I think currently I'm fine, just a little bit of thinning, but I think once I am, like, largely bald, I would love to have just a giant selection of nice comfy hats and a beanie with a brim. As weird as that sounds, is, like, high on my list of things I'd wanted. Oh. I see. Meant Broski Mall, not me. Oh. There's some XCOM missions. Ooh. I love XCOM. I wish I had the time and the patience to go back and play it. Chimera Squad was perfect. That was, that was so much shorter and, like, more focused, and it felt right for me. And so I'm I'm really hoping whatever the next XCOM game is kind of follows suit again. Is this game fun? It looks simultaneously very satisfying and very monotonous. Absolutely. Uh, you've described exactly why it is fun. It is not... It is effectively... Uh, the You know when people say the grind is the best part of, like, a video game? This kind of embodies that, where the actual gameplay of it is terribly monotonous. I'm doing the same thing over and over again. It's not like any of these are particularly challenging. It's just so satisfying to be here. Uh, just see a surface and clean a surface. And an amount of it is also, like, figuring out how to optimize my own actions... Uh, the easiest way I could describe it, or compare it, would be, like, why Hard Space Shipbreaker is so good. Because Hard Space Shipbreaker is terribly monotonous. You're just ripping the same ships apart with mild variations over and over and over again. I, to some degree, I'd almost even say that this game has more variation than Hard Space Shipbreaker. But, the thing is, they're both just super satisfying with, like, how they perform. Because, it's, the core gameplay loop is is its own reward in a way that, yeah, most games don't. Yeah, it's a de-stressing game. Sort of, yeah. I don't know if I necessarily need to de-stress. I just wanted to play something that was really easy for the for a couple of days. Shadow of the Colossus tilted me pretty bad. And so, I Shadow of the Colossus and RoboQuest in the same day. I think it was. Like, I was just... A little granko. By the end of it. Cranko? Cranko. Not Granko. What the hell was that even? I don't know. A good game for streamers that just want to rant or chat. Yeah, pretty much. Ideal fashion would be an LED robot helmet with changeable faces. Whatever's comfortable in and whatever's comfortable in your closet. I I unironically want to get one of those with like um, uh, proper like mask filters. Uh, so that when I go to conventions, I can cosplay as Wanderbot, but also have a mask on the entire time. I'm trying to convince Shell to... I'm not going to say give up on her artistic aspirations, uh, but... You know, the whole art theft thing more or less has made it that she's not particularly excited about, you know, just going back and doing artwork like she used to. Um, and so I'm trying to convince her to work on, like, her own, you know, illustrated novel kind of thing... Uh, voice acting and, you know, kind of cosplay on the side. So, specifically, she will make a, um... So, she'll specifically make us both, like, uh... Daft Punk-esque, uh, Wanderbot outfits. Because I think that would be really cool. So, do you want a Wanderbot helmet? Absolutely! Hell, 
I what I'd like to do is I actually really want to get a uh, 3D printer. Um, I want to get a 3D printer and effectively 3D model a Wanderbot helmet and then print it, and then just pop a visor in. Because that way I could have like kind of a a more high detail one, and I want a low poly one. That's like, uh. A lot more like blocky shapes, because I think that would be really cool. How much do the 3D printers cost, roughly? A lot. Please don't, please don't actually start donating money so I can buy one. You've already donated plenty. Let's see, one out of full suit, mainly just because hot. I would much rather have like a, uh, like a navy blue body suit, or body suit, uh, uh, just like a navy navy blue body suit, and just like standard streetwear, you know. Shirt, shoes, hoodie if it's cold. And if you got the budget, I can give you printer recommendations. Uh, belay that for a couple of months. Uh, my my current house has no good spots for a three D printer. However, um, like I've been low key house hunting during my like free points, and like I've been looking at houses that are easily a thousand feet bigger than my current one. Which like I'm not sure if I need all that space. But, boy, it's nice to think of all the room for activities that I could have. Let's see, many of us would be willing to print a helmet for you. Fair! But I want to print it for myself. Hey, your bot wears art, uh, clothes in your art, so it's not out of brand. I mean, it used to be out of brand, then I... Then I realized that, like, if I ever did want to cosplay as it, it would be weird. The interesting thing is, uh, the Wonderbot design was originally, like, a just... I'm gonna say, like, a cartoony or Warframe for a while. Uh, but the original design was a... It was, like, a dude with a box head. Uh, in a navy blue hoodie with white pants and boots. And then, um... And then I switched the box head for the current, like, Wanderbot silhouette, but it was only, like, one prong on the top. Um, but I, I kept the hoodie and whatnot. And then I did, like, a realistic version that was brown. It was, like, wearing kind of more just, like, uh, it felt like more military-style armor. Um, but so I, I, I had that for, like, a, a class assignment, and that kind of informed the initial YouTube version that was like the full robot. And now I'm going back to the original, not box head design, but the the hoodie and pants thing. And thank you, Dragoneer, for the 25,000 bits. You can't stop the confetti. Also new bit badge acquired. Dang. You single-handedly are going to make it, so I have to actually revamp the bit badges so I have nicer looking ones at the top. We were a little lazy about them, but still. We'll warn you, 3D printers do take a lot of work in themselves. Oh, I'm sure. Which is why I would get Shell to do it for me. <laughs> um, she loves cosplay way more than I do. Like, I would do the 3D modeling, and she would do the actual, like, putting together. Because uh, currently, uh, so she's at her parents' place and has been for the past two weeks. She's actually going to be there for a couple more days uh, because there's really bad storms in Atlanta that effectively made her flight back to Portland not feasible. Um, but... Let's see. But so one of the things she's been doing is agonizing over what of her old cosplays she wanted to get rid of. Because uh, she had a really lovely Samus cosplay, a really lovely... Mist Maintainer cosplay, a really lovely Haku cosplay, Sheik cosplay, you know, like, she's a pretty good cosplayer, but one of the common overtone, overtones, one of the common elements to all of her cosplays was blind panic because it was always for cosplay chess in college, and so many of her cos cosplays were, you know, put together over the course of, like, maybe a couple of months, um, with, like, a, a deadline, so a lot of cut corners, Maybe not the most durable, not a whole lot of, like, high-quality, hard-surface anything. And so, um... And so, uh... She specifically, uh... Has been, like, waffling over whether or not she wants to... 
Uh, what is that? Oh. Oh, there's a gap. That's funny. There's, there's a very small gap in the level geometry. And in this, it was like, yeah, it's kind of like right around here. There was a light. Yeah, there we go. Freaks me out a little bit. And I'm like, what the hell is that? I always love finding little holes in level geometry. I don't know. It's like, uh, it's like seeing the Wizard of Oz, kind of.